understanding you as a person and, and your kind of entrepreneurial talent means that you've actually made it onto the main program. And so that affords you a number of, of benefits um, over the coming six and 12 months. Um, so that's really it for me. I'm really, I'm really excited about uh, having you on board. Um, I think it's going to be a fantastic uh, cohort and I'm looking forward to getting started. Thanks, Aisha. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. And like I say, everyone, that was Chris Moore, Head of Innovation. And no doubt you'll be getting very familiar with Chris over the next few months um, with regards to all the sort of requests that will be coming in as well. Um, and also some of you will be lucky enough to have him as a mentor. So more on that to follow in the few slides to come. Yeah, Air, would you like to say a few words about yourself just to reintroduce yourself to the group? Yeah, hi, I'm Yair. I'm the Student Enterprise Coordinator here at RGU. And um, yeah, for those of you who have not met at the showcase, uh, who were not at the showcase, I'm excited to meet you in the weeks up uh, in the coming weeks. And yeah, we're really excited to see how you progress as a startup, as an individual. And yeah, we look forward to working with you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Excellent. Okay. So in terms of keeping on time and thank you for sharing all the lovely feedback that you did um, about the bootcamp. So I know for some of you, you were saying uh, the, keeping to the timing was really important. So we will strive to do that over the next few months as well. Uh, and just to say, obviously, if there are going to be any changes or anything like that, we will, of course, let you know to this, you know, um, in advance of the, the changes that are coming for schedules and of sessions and things like that. But um, yes, just in the interest of, of time, we will get the ball rolling just now so like i say congratulations you know um chris said it as well just there it is really stiff competition to actually get to the stage that you've got to this is weeks now at this point Yay! of um getting through <laughs> round of applause, everyone absolutely yeah round of applause round of applause give everybody a thumbs up yeah if you've got a thumbs up put it put it on the on the screen and things you know feel free to interact as well um you know if you want to you know be fun because we're we're not we're quite friendly in the ig team we are quite approachable um and that's why we've done different things to make our you know access to us you know quite open um so please do feel free to jump in there with any questions and things you know you might think you have a silly question but um we'd much rather you you ask us than kind of wonder to yourself so Congratulations again, like we were saying there. Um, in terms of just some some suggestions for the um, well, the uh, suggestions and guidelines, to be honest, uh, for the session and for the whole um, actually the whole cohort up until May, is we really advise you to make the most of this opportunity. Like I say, you've worked hard to get here already. You've had weeks of at this point of applications, and you know even for writing and crafting the application, I'm sure probably took some time for you. Um, and then to get to the boot camp, which is another commitment. So you've already invested all this energy um, just to get in. And now you're here. We want you to make the most of it. You know, it makes sense that you make the most of it. So we advise you attend every session. You know, you grab the opportunity with both hands because it's not going to last forever. And before you know it, this will swing. <laughs> it will accelerate. It really does accelerate in the accelerator. And we will be at May. And then you'll be looking back and thinking, gosh, what was that? You know, what happened? And, you know actually have people who want to come back again and again and you might not always get the opportunity to come back so I advise you to seize this opportunity with both hands and make the most of it so attend every session um, and we will be making note of that as well in terms of attendance so we will be keeping a session register of who is actually attending and all of these things count towards things like funding and further opportunities that you will you may or may not get access to later on the program for example being able to pitch on stage at the final showcase um, so we would strongly advise you for yourselves to want to attend every session and also just to make sure you're not kind of limiting the opportunity because as a team we're kind of tracking your progress and engagement with the program we want you to do well and as a reward we will be keeping that into consideration for things like your final uh, showcase pitching as well um, and that lends very nicely to actively participating so we're strongly encouraging you to actively participate um, you know and, and get engaged ask those questions you know we're all in this together so to speak um, and sometimes you know you might share something that could be value of some to someone else you know even a team member or the cohort or even the team eig team as well so 
please do actively participate and share those resources. We often find that you give what you get, so it often comes back around. Uh, make time for advanced work or tasks as well. So often, you know, you will find that uh, when we have a session, uh, especially on a Saturday, there will be a milestone task that you go away and do because we then meet in the next two weeks. But there's always that interim period where it's a case of maybe going away, doing some market research, some customer discovery, you know, what the, the milestone task may be can vary. But um, it's always kind of allocating some period in that time that, yes, we're not physically meeting or, you know, virtually meeting that week. But just bear in mind that there might be some milestone tasks to accomplish for the next time that we do meet. So just carve out some time for that in your calendar as well. And then we may ask that you commit to the program. You know, we're committed to the program for you. We're excited for you. We want you to do well. Um, I want you to grow and expand and we ask that you come to it kind of with with arms open um, and you know trust the process as they say and then be open to uh, pivots and ready to learn as well uh, all of these things will serve you well um, so in terms of house rules please do turn your camera on you know obviously when we're going to be interacting through the session we're going to be doing breakout rooms and things like that please you know you know yourself if you're online and someone's got their camera off the whole time it's really hard to engage with that person especially when you're trying to get to know people so please do have your camera on and have your right name on as well so we can identify like I say we're keeping a register we're keeping an attendance sheet so please do have your right name we don't want to miss you out and you've been there the whole time because you're just down as iPhone you know so please do have your full name um or your first name at least on so we can identify it's you um and remember remember to mute of course if there's any interference with sound you know that can be annoying as well post any questions you have in the t in the chat sessions are recorded but will be shared only privately and then we ask that you join zoom on time so we can you know keep to schedule for everybody else as well um okay so you'll you recognize these a lot <laughs> So this is the EIG team, the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group. This is, yes, from boot camp. You probably recognize a few maybe outfits, what people were wearing. Um, you know, and like I was saying at the boot camp, uh, it's not to be underestimated the wealth of experience in this team for running this program for six years now. You know, there's a reason that it's been so long lasting. Um, and also, this is really a, a really strong resource that you have access to, um, especially, you know, for the next five months, you know, and beyond as well, if you develop those relationships but each of these people in this picture have different specialisms different experiences uh different uh you know words of advice different chat opportunities different expansion opportunities for yourself so i would suggest that you strongly you know you make use of them uh while you have the time to um so you know I, we all introduce ourselves at the boot camp um but if you want to i mean going from left to right we've got ft we've got chris we've got diana who's our entrepreneur in residence we've got candace in the center Dawn, myself, Yair, and Graham. And like I was saying, we all have different specialisms as well. So if anybody needs a reminder, please feel free. Um, but we will also be engaging with the EIG team naturally, organically, as the program progresses. Everyone you see in this picture will be participating in this program, the accelerator program, depending on their specialism. So you'll definitely be able to reach out to them, even if they're not your mentor they will probably come and speak to you um, as the program progresses. So it's just to let you know that, that we are all friendly and we're all happy to help and we want to see you do well as well. Okay, so that brings me up onto the question of first mentors. So if you have a note and a pen, um, just make a note of who your first mentor is. And if anybody misses this, I can I can let you know. Um, but we have our first mentors to share now. Um, so we have for our first one, so for Big Dog Stories, that's Colin. Your first mentor will be myself, Colin. So that's great. I'm looking forward to working with you. Uh, Cardio Intel. So that's Ede Deji, Olubenga, and Gwanke. Uh, I will also be your first mentor. So that's great. Looking forward to working with you as well, because I believe some of you are coming from different places, Coventry, Ethiopia as well. So that's really cool. Um, and a really cool idea as well. Um, digital hearts, twin hearts. Sounds exciting. Uh, Carney Bees is going to be sitting with Chris. So that's Rebecca and Kaya. So that's great. Chris is really excited to get working with you as well. And Power Her will be sitting with Candace. So that's going to be Sabina. 
All right. So Candace will be your first mentor. Uh, GB Rights Consult, so Georgiana, will be sitting with Chris and also Diana will be supporting in that capacity also. So that's that's really exciting. Uh, Inno Sports will be Chris and also FT will be jumping in there. So that's Jan and Luis. You will have Chris and FT on that one. It's Ronnie will be Yair and Chris. So Ronnie, Veronica, you will have your first mentor be um, Yair and Chris also. Uh, Nadarak, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correct completely, but Nadarak will be Dawn as a first mentor. For Nadarak, we have Jacob. Yeah. So we have Jacob and Cyril for Nadarak, and that will be Dawn. Dawn Shand, who will be your first mentor. That takes us on to honor roll. So Naime, I'm not sure if I'm saying this all right either. Forgive me for any pronunciations. I'm sure I'll get it right by the time the months progress. Your first mentor will be Graham, Graham Carter. Okay. Placement hub will be Candace. Placement hub, we have Jeremy and Rory down for that. Revive Geosciences will be Graham. Okay, so that's Wei Fang and Shaji. Um, so that's good. Uh, excited to get going there. STEM spec will be Diana. Okay, so that's our entrepreneur in residence, Diana Gormley. And that's Ojo Tule and Emmanuel. Team Up North will be Shauna and Josh. Okay, and that and that is Dawn. So your Dawn will be your first mentor for Team Up North for Shauna and Josh. And Weave Centrics will be Graham. Graham Carter, so that's Mike. Mike, who jumped out of an airplane 13 times or something. <laughs> you, I remember that from the boot camp. Um, your first mentor will be Graham. And finally, but not last but not least, Yahaya's International Hub will be FT. So that's Shiva. Okay. Um, you have all now been allocated your first mentors. If anybody has any questions with regards to that, please let me know. They will be in touch with you and you would also um I'd also suggest that you reach out to them um to initiate that sort of um relationship in terms of how often you'd like to meet, you know, get the ball rolling. Um, we will make their contact information available to you. We'll always suggest that it's a good practice to reach out to them first, um, to initiate that uh, relationship. And then, you know, also going forward, the onus really would be more on you to make use of that resource. Um, so things like there will be certain guidelines for mentoring as well. Um, you probably will have, for example, to keep a bit of a, a, a report of the, the sessions that you have with your mentors in terms of, you know, agreed on what you're going to be doing going into the sessions and then afterwards as well, next steps forward. Um, so more on that to follow as well. But those so, are... Asha, your, was, yeah. Sorry, Asha, I was just going to say, so, so your first mentor relationship is a really important one that you have because your first mentor is really your first port of call. It's your connectivity into the accelerator. Um, other, other than, otherwise, Aisha would just get you know, um, uh, 25 emails from, from different people. So if you want to connect into the Accelerator program, you have a question about it, then it's really your first mentor who will do that for you. So go to them in the first instance, and then they will either deal with it. And if they feel they can't deal with it, then they'll go to Aisha. But also their role is really to nudge you along more than anything is to make sure that, you know, you understanding the stuff that we're, we're delivering to you and that you are making practical use of that. Um, you know, one of the things that we do quite early on is get, get you to go and speak to potential customers. And so they will try and help you to identify who those customers are and possibly help you set up meetings with those customers. They might even join you for some of those customer meetings, um, but they'll be the person that's making sure that you're doing it. Um, because it's difficult to progress if, if we don't see it's an accelerator program after all. So if we don't see that progression, then, you know, it's going to be difficult for you to keep up with the content that we're going to be throwing at you because it's a bit like what MIT say, it's drinking from a fire hydrant. We're going to be giving you lots and lots of information to try and accelerate your, your startup and only by sort of working with your first mentor. So it's likely that in the first instance, I'll probably meet with my um, teams probably every two weeks and it will probably follow the Saturday 
So we'll have the 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 Wednesday, the Monday and the Wednesday. Then we'll have the Saturday session. Then probably the following week, I'll try and set up a meeting just so that we can start to embed some of that learning, and I can help you to um, do the tasks that are set for you. And I imagine the other mentors will will do something similar. Um, but they're really your key contact as part of this process. What we will then do that. Well, the reason they're called first mentors is because then we have a range of second and third mentors. Uh, and those people are often um, brought in as and when required. Um, so if we need some support with finance, then we might find someone who has experience in finance. If we need some support with market entry or marketing or exporting or uh, digital technology, then we will look at who we need. And then your first mentor will have a nice you know, black book of list of experts that they can call upon and we can bring people in to support you as and when. So they're kind of the second mentors. And some of them have very expert uh, domain knowledge and others will have very general sort of startup knowledge. But uh, the, the first mentors will support you to get those second mentors. Thanks, Aisha. Thank you so much, Chris. Absolutely. Just like Chris is saying there, um, they're a bit of a constant thread, I suppose, your mentors. So, you know, obviously, as the program progresses, if you have that sort of constant point, you can keep going back to for support with your pitches, what have you, um, someone you need to practice on with your pitches and things like that, you know, whatever the case may be, that person is most likely to be your first mentor. Because there's so many different people involved in this program, but they will be that constant thread for you during the five months. So please do go up to them in the first instance, um, you know, with any sort of questions you might have. Obviously, I'm here. I'm available. Um, you can always ask me too. Um, but, you know, if there's certain things you're maybe not sure about, the first mentors as well can be really useful for that. Josh, did you have a question? I think I saw your hand was raised. You want to unmute? Yeah, I was going to ask um, a question. Chris covered it. It was about the first mentors. If they're going to be our first mentors would have like ones later or we sort of cleared it up and says we'd have other mentors that would come in so I was basically would our mentors be there throughout the process or would it be like a cycle of them yeah you, you your first mentor will be there from start to finish though yeah they will be exactly. there exactly yeah so so the first mentors will be the sort of constant thread through the program and then you might get additional mentors on top of that so second and third mentors but your first mentors will be with you throughout the whole time yeah mm-hmm Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so um, just moving along. Um, so that's the first mentors. Like I say, any questions, let me know. Um, we're going to play a, a quick icebreaker. So in terms of meeting your fellow entrepreneurs, um, there's quite a big turnout tonight, which is fantastic. So it's about 24 of you in the room. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to sort of get to meet your fellow entrepreneurs. Um, now, you've met some of each other. You know, we appreciate you've already met at the boot camp to a certain degree, but that was a wee while ago. It's a bit of a refresher. Um, my colleague Yair has kind of been uh, setting up the breakout rooms, I believe, in the background, um, which is great. And what we're going to do here is just have, did somebody have a question? Okay, that's a question. That's fine. I'll, I'll ask her that um, later, Emmanuel. Thank you. Um, in this, we're going to play the, the hipster hustler hacker game. Um, so what we're going to do in the breakout rooms is going to be six sessions or six minutes each for the session is we're going to identify yourself as either your hustler, your hacker, or your hipster. So what we mean by this is, and we play this in MIT as well, it's a sort of nice fun getting to know you. When you have a business and you want to be successful, um, you know, as we'll know, often business is a team sport. Um, so it's very rare that, you know, someone will be an equal balance of all three. Some people do say that, you know, they're an equal balance of all three. More likely than not, you're, my, you're maybe a bit stronger in maybe, say, the hustler department, which is selling the products. So are you really good at business development management? Are you good at networking? Are you good at going to events? All these sorts of things. Are you good at hosting events? So are you the hustler? Are you the one that's about the brand profile, getting, you know, your name out there? Um, you know, if that's you, you would identify yourself as a hustler in the breakout room and you sort of talk about that um, and, you know, share a little bit about um, wh what that means to you. Um, the hacker is a person who builds a product. So here we can have, if you're talking in a technical space, I suppose, you know, if you're talking about movies, you see people hacking away in the background, you know, computer programming, you know, they've got the hoodies and they've got, you know, the dark rooms and all that sort of stuff. So are you the person who builds a product? Now, it could be a digital product. It could be a physical product. Um, it could be that you're the hacker with regards to honey making. 
Okay, so you really know your stuff with regards to honey and honey infusions. Um, so you have the technical know-how, if you will. So you're more about building the product in itself. And the hipster is a person who pimps the products, who's really into trends, who really knows what's going on, who knows things about design and all these sorts of things of how to bring the, the product to life as well. Um, so we want you to sort of take a few minutes to identify that. We're just going to play this for six minutes, okay? Um, just conscious of time and keeping to time. Um, and so identify if you're a hustler, if you're a hacker, if you're a hipster in your breakout rooms, have a wee conversation about that. And also we want you to think about discussing something that no one else knows about you. Um, so what is it that, you know, some random facts about you? I mean, we did this on the Padlet, so a certain degree with a fun fact, but what is a really kind of maybe obscure uh, thing that maybe someone doesn't know about you and share that, share that in the group as well, because this is all about getting to know each other. Okay, so yeah, yeah are we good to go with the breakout rooms now? It might be worth everyone if it's a six minute. If, are they going to be in rooms of three, three people per room? Yes, yeah. I, I believe so. But I'm, yeah, I'm not... two, minutes, two minutes each. If there's six minutes, so about two minute sheets for talking to try and get around everyone. So mm -hmm. don't one person dominate for six minutes. Try yes. and move, try and move around the room if, if you can, because then we're going to flip you and put you in another room for another six minutes with someone else. We might do this two or three times, I think, just so you can get around as many people as possible. But can I just clarify how many rooms should there be? Okay, so there's going to be 24 people. So if you can try and do three each initially, um, so there should be, if my master, <laughs> yeah, my master doesn't serve me wrong, so there should be eight. Yes, yeah. Okay, then I'll need another second. Um, okay, after. yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah. Um, so I hope the exercise is clear. You're kind of identifying, oh, Shiva's got a, a hand raised. Yes, would you like to jump in? Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, well, was my question was Aisha is when when I mean, are you talking about your product? Um, and then the other person in the room would guess you're gonna be the hustler or hacker or hipster. Is it is it the way that the, the, the game is is kind of played? It's, it's it's not so much a game i suppose it's more like getting to know you so it's more you yeah. identifying yourself shiva um mm -hmm. you know are you a not the product or not the not the your business mm -hmm. idea yourself yeah it's more like you're just getting oh. to know your personality yeah mm -hmm. right, yeah. right. Okay. okay okay thank you so, so so for example if i was in a room i would um i would say i'm a hustler at first although most people are a bit of everything if i'm honest i'm definitely not yeah. a hacker I would need it in my if I started a, a startup team, I would now I would need a hacker. I would need somebody that could code or could build the product because that's certainly not my my skill set at all. Um, I can I can go and sell a product. Um, I like to think I'm a designer, but I think other people would probably say that I'm not a good, I could be a good designer. So I probably need someone else to come in and do the user interface and make it look you know sexy. And and if you think about um, if you think about some of the greatest businesses, I mean if you think about Apple. You obviously had Steve Jobs, who was the hustler. You had um, uh, Ive, I've forgotten his first name, Jonathan Ive, who was the designer. Mm. And then um, and they, they also had a hacker guy whose name I forget now. This is what happens on a Monday when you have uh, Zoom calls at six o'clock. Um, but, you know, they had three really strong in each of these areas. And I guess it's just for you to think about if you were going to be one of these people, where, you, where do your strengths lie? Because what that then helps you to identify is actually – if I am going to build this product and take it to market, what what other kind of team member strengths do I do I need if I'm going to build an entrepreneurial team? Mm -hmm. Definitely, Chris. And, you know, it's good we're doing this exercise now as well, because it's maybe making you think, you know, you've had a had quite a few people sign up for the program so far, which is great. Um, but maybe you'll start to think, OK, do you know what? I am more of a hustler. I maybe do need a hipster. I maybe do need a hacker. Um, so you might want to have people, other people join your team. We have that as well in the program. We had that last year. Um, you know, became quite evident um, to really progress things. You would maybe need to find someone um, with a skill set, you know, potentially. And it might be that you're the hacker and you need a hustler. Um, so it's really good. It's a bit of self-identification in terms of, you know, what you have, where you're kind of more strongly drawn or identifying which of these three you're strongly identifying with more um, and potentially an opportunity of growth as well. Um, so, yeah. Uh, are we ready with those rooms, breakout rooms just now? Yes, yeah. we are. 
Brilliant. Yeah, okay. We're all good. Great. Uh, yeah, we're all good. Thank you. And like Chris was saying there, we're going to start off, you know, this is going to be six minutes. We'll do this a couple of iterations, you know, a couple of times, a couple of ways around um, to mix people up as well. Um, so any questions will be in the main room as well. We might be jumping into the rooms as well. Take a quick hello. All right. So have fun. Enjoy it. And we'll see you soon. So if you could please join your rooms now, breakout rooms now, that would be great. Thank you, Yair. Okay, so that's the breakout rooms open now. If you'd like to join, I think I can see people joining, which is great. Okay, a couple more people just waiting to join. Yep. Brilliant. That's everybody in now. Looks like. How do we how do we see the breakout rooms again? It's been so long since I've used Zoom. Oh, mine just pops up. Um, but if you go to breakout rooms, uh, if you see the dots, there should be little three dots um, for the Zoom bar, Got the it. toolbar. Yeah, and the breakout room is there. Yeah, Found it. Well done. God, it's been so long since I've used Zoom. I know. It's kind of, it comes back to you, though, because we'll be doing this so often now. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be all over Zoom in a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so that's a really good turnout, isn't it? I think. But I'm going to be around. Yeah, but I'm going to be around ending of February. Yeah, so for me, I started out as a hacker, but I suppose right now I'm more of a hustler. The irony is being a hustler isn't necessarily my nature, but that is what I got to do nowadays. That's what I do, you know, and, you know, I guess you got to do what you got to do, right? Completely. And that's such a really strong point. You know, so much of this journey is an adventure and adventures often are putting ourselves in uncomfortable spots. A bit like Indiana Jones, he didn't necessarily want to be, you know, fighting off in the lost and last crusades and all these sorts of things. You know, he doesn't like snakes, he hates snakes, for example, you know, but he had to be surrounded by snakes. And that was his challenge as part of his adventure. So similar to yourselves, it might be public speaking. It might be something else that, you know, is really alien and really foreign to you. But actually, you, ne you never knew you could expand to that space as well. So it's a really exciting opportunity for personal growth. So thank you, Olubenga, for, for highlighting that as well. Your natural inclination is maybe more hacking, but you're finding yourself having to be more of a, of a hustler these days. So that's really strong. That's really powerful. Okay, well, great. So yeah, yeah, are we good to go again for the breakout rooms? Another, another turnaround, just for another quick six minutes? Yes, we are. Okay, right. I'll open them. Thank you so much. Please join your breakout rooms, guys. That was very smooth, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Smoothly done. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It was very smooth. Yeah. Catching on quick, it's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Oh, that was so nice. A spitfire. Wow. Oh, yeah. Cool. Let's jump into a, a room. Yeah. Oh, there was a question. Where are you going to go? Okay. Yeah, yeah, are you wanting to jump into a breakout room or did you want to stay out here? Um, well, I'm going to pop to the bathroom and then I'll hop into a breakout room. Okay, sure. Sounds good. Because yeah. he has a lot of knowledge about the market itself that because he's been in the healthcare and he knows all like uh, crazy stats and, and everything that of course is, is really knowledgeable. But um, I think he he's more like a, right now a hustler because he likes to do the relationships and 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 and, and the business driven decisions. So yeah, that's what we were discussing a little bit. 
Yeah, bit of a hybrid, absolutely. In fact, I gave a similar response uh, when I was uh, last played this game. I'm a bit of a mixture of both, so it's kind of normal, I guess, um, to to be a mixture, maybe not just one exclusively. Um, but you might f still find, you know, you have certain stronger muscles in in one department compared to the other. But yes, speaking yeah. about the digital heart twin and all these sort of even cardio and cell sounds really exciting as well. Um, did anybody else from the other rooms want to share anything about this session, this quick one, the six minutes? Uh, second breakout room. Emmanuel, yeah. have you signed up? Oh, Emmanuel, go. go for it. Yeah, um, our breakout room was quite interesting, but I heard from Colin, who was the first person ever I've heard who identified their, you know, their strength to lean towards the hipster side because he worked with the alumni. So I ran a quick check by asking him if he remembered me when he. He took photographs during graduation and show us hell he did. So he's a true hipster. <laughs> oh, that's great. I, Colin, did you hear that? <laughs> I remembered everything. Oh, <laughs> I'll have to bear that in mind for this one. It, <laughs> it was a good interaction. It was very good. But yeah, no, I remember Emmanuel very well. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I mean, it's fantastic, you know, and we're so lucky to have this cohort be a mixture of familiar faces. You might know RGU, RGU staff, and also, you know, research students or alumni and, you know, graduates. So it's a really strong, powerful mix we've got here, guys. And I'm really excited to see what can happen in the future. But Colin, I think that was just a stamp of approval you got from Emmanuel. So that, <laughs> that's great to see as well. Okay, so fantastic. I think just in the interest of time, we will move on to the next section because it's coming up to about 20 past six. But not to worry, there'll be plenty more opportunities to get to know each other and sort of mingle and, and chat a bit more. Please use things like the Teams channel now, have a chat on there. The WhatsApp group is more for you guys as well. You know, we'll maybe pop in every now and then, but you know, we really want you to get to know each other because there's just so much strength in the cohort in itself um, in terms of the shared experiences you're all bringing to the table as well and friendships as well, potentially, you know. So please do to make the most of yeah, um, this uh, social opportunity as well. Um, Okay, so with regards to the actual session schedule, so we'll do the program overview, um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I know that we've gone over this quite a few times now already in the information sessions and also at the boot camp. Introduction to phase one desirability, the problem opportunity statement, and then we'll be talking about the value proposition statement. Remember, you did this in the boot camp as well, so it's a bit of a refresher just to cover that again. Often we find people don't get it the first go. The value proposition statement can be such a challenge. And I know some people were sharing, you know, what they, they came up with and some of you used it for your pitch. But honestly, it's quite normal to be sitting, trying to figure out this value proposition statement in a really concise and succinct manner. So it's going to take a few goes. <clears throat> and also you might have different versions for your different customer segments as well. So that's another sort of, um, you know, Pandora's box as well, in a sense. Um, so just just bear in mind that if you don't get it first time, that's absolutely fine. And then we'll be introducing the business model canvas and um business models as well. Um, okay, so in terms of program overview, we spoke about this at the boot camp, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. We're helping you. We want to help you find that innovation sweet spot. So I did a Neil Blethers podcast recently, and I was basically talking about my time with my business. I used to run a business for seven years, as I shared last time, and I had two branches, one in Aberdeen, one in Dundee, a staff of six. Now, the business was doing all right. The business was, you know, 250k turnover. That's fairly decent. It's not too bad um, in an annual, you know, turnover. But honestly, did I get it right in terms of the business model? I can hand on my heart say I didn't. You know, I had a hot product, I had a hot commodity that should have sold really well, and it did, but it was limited because it was a retail business model I chose. Why did I choose a retail business model? Honestly, because potentially it was the most familiar to me. It's something I could understand coming from Nigeria as well. Retail is huge, you know, you have shops everywhere. People are really familiar with retail. It's, you know, it's easy to be honest. It's maybe not so challenging. I'm not saying that retail is, is super easy, but... Comparing starting a business in retail, which is a, a familiar business model and something you can start relatively quickly compared to going off and learning the technical skills to maybe have an online business, which would have taken longer, you know, you know, so it was the easier option for me um, at that time. It still came with its own challenges, of course, all sorts of, you know, liability insurance and all these different things you need to think about. 
But honestly, looking back, do I wish I'd paid a bit more attention to a little thing called YouTube? <laughs> yes, definitely. Because when I started my business back in 2007, YouTube was just sort of gaining ground. So if I actually went more the techie innovation route, would that business have succeeded and actually had the sustaining power and sustainability and still maybe been around today? Potentially. So this is what we're trying to get you to think outside the box a little bit and get you to that innovation sweet spot. Because it's often, the innovation sweet spot is something in the middle. It's in the middle of the desirability. So my uh, products were uh, hair extensions, clip-on hair extensions. People desired them. It was a hot product at the time. They were new. Um, they were feasible because I could, you know, sell them with regards to it was retail sales, I guess. So things were fairly straightforward um, and it was I was able to produce the product or, you know, provide the product, which is great. We had the adaptability as well going on in terms of making it happen with suppliers and things like that. And we had the viability. So the numbers made sense to a certain degree. But I was missing that innovative sweet spot in the middle. So the innovative sweet spot is going to intersect if you've got a really exciting business that can be, you know, really long lasting and super profitable, you'll often find it's something that intersects all of these sort of four circles here. Um, and it kind of leads into the business model canvas, which we'll go into as well. So um, have a we think about, you know, these four circles and maybe how you can get that sweet spot of them all intersecting each other. So you've got a bit of the feasibility there, you've got a bit of desirability, a bit of the viability and a bit of the adaptability in there. And you'll probably find if you've got a bit of all those four things in equal measure, maybe to a certain degree, you've got a really exciting new way of doing a business, and which is what we call the innovation uh, sweet spot. Um, so in terms of this, again, I'm not going to spend too much time because you really have a list of all of this. We cover this in the boot camp. Um, as you'll know, it's not just uh, online sessions. We will have some in-person sessions. Really excited about the one on Saturday coming up. Um, and, you know, we have opportunities this year, really exciting to be able to work with a transformational coach, which is just fantastic in terms of confidence building and things like that, self-reflection. Um, we will also have networking opportunities this year, which are really exciting. So going more into the field of the ecosystem um, and interactive contact uh, content, which you'll have on Articulate Rise uh, as well. Uh, and again, this is just a reminder of the program dates and sessions. Again, you saw this in Bootcamp. Slight adjustment, I will say that's highlighted there in se uh, session six, um, which is that we're hosting the, not this Saturday one, this Saturday coming, we're going to be at the One Tech Hub as advisor at School Hill, but the following Saturday is going to be at the Innovation Station. So please make a note of that. <clears throat> so the Innovation Station is based at the Garth D campus. So a slight change there with the addresses for the um, session we have coming up on the 24th of February. Okay, so please don't get confused. The first Saturday, which is this Saturday we have coming up, that's the One Tech Hub School Hill. If anybody needs address or anything like that, let me know. You, you should... Um, I should, I'll probably share that on the team's channel as well. Um, but the second session will be at Garth D. Okay. And then also we've just taken out the networking ecosystem day because that is optional at the bottom because that just leans on to me anyway. What I will also do is I will share a snapshot of this in the team's channel in case anybody hasn't got this to hand. Okay. Okay, so as I said, the benefits, you know, mentorship, co-working space, funding opportunities as well. You start off, everybody will start off with a thousand pounds, but of course, as you know, as the program progresses, you have potential opportunity to bulk your, you know, boost your earnings, boost your winnings. Um, so that will come in, like I was saying, with regards to the engagement and also the pitching and things like that with the final showcase, okay? Um, and the prizes this year are currently starting at five thousand pounds. And you can win multiples of that as well, potentially for the showcase. So just to keep that in mind. Um, so during the program, we are going to have a dedicated team space, like I said, uh, so you should all be uh, added onto that. Let me know if you've not had an invite come through for just yet. The teams can be a bit funny sometimes if it's not an uh, rgu.ac.uk um, email address, um, but you've all been invited using your sort of Gmails and things like that. But Teams can be a bit funny sometimes, but let me know if that hasn't come through for you, but you should all have your invites now. You will also be invited to the LinkedIn group 
um, uh, it's a private listed LinkedIn group, and I will share details of that in the Teams chat as well. The reason why, why are we doing Teams and LinkedIn? The reason why we're doing LinkedIn this year as well is because it's great if you have an active LinkedIn profile that your experiences are all listed there. So your cohort can get to know each other if you're a part of this group, and then you know you can see each other's experiences and things like that more easily. Then you can start to say, okay, maybe I need to reach out to this person in the team or the cohort or what have you. It's just easier to see at a glance what everybody's professional um, experience has been so far in case you need to reach out to them as well. And it's a great way to keep in touch. I think everybody in RG pretty much uses LinkedIn, which is great. Um, so you will get associated student status as well. If you're not a student, don't you worry. That will be sorted out for you. So you have access to library, Microsoft Office and more, which is another advantage. And like I say, the sessions will be delivered on Zoom um for the the virtual sessions so introducing phase one now phase one is going to be desirability so if you go back to all those sessions listing you know we had a uh, different columns you'll see there's phase one phase two phase three and phase four so phase one is where we're starting off with today with desirability and like i was saying they're using the innovation you know the desirability sweet spot um, innovation sweet spot in the middle there another thing that we've drawn if you like you can liken those four circles to the business model canvas so some of you might have seen this before okay which is fantastic it's great if you're familiar with it if you're not familiar with it that's absolutely fine as well i would always liken this to a one pager business plan OK, so, you know, in my back in the day when I used to be a business advisor, people think oh, I need to come with a business plan. Not necessarily. You don't need to necessarily write a 40 page business plan. This is kind of a condensed way of being able to see looking at your business in a one sort of viewing um, in a one or if you will, the different sections of your business. OK, so what we typically do with the business model canvas is we use this tool quite heavily um, in the in AIG and Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group. And what we'll do is we'll start off with a customer relationship sort of section. Okay. So the section to the left is your desirability, I'm sorry, right is your desirability. And that's your customer relationships, customer segments and channels. We also work with the vision, which is the value proposition, which you've heard about already in the bootcamp. Okay, so we've had kind of touched on that already through the different uh, the sessions we've been doing. And then we'll lead on to things like your feasibility, which is your key partners, activities, key resources. And we'll sort of go around in a, in a circle, if you will, in a loop to the key costs and also the revenue streams at the bottom, bottom which is your viability. So that's kind of how the program is going to work, if you will. So the Startup Accelerator is going to follow this sort of format. OK, if you're looking for a visual aid or a visual diagram, I suppose, of how the program is going to roll out, this probably would be it. Um, so it's certainly something I would recommend checking out. It's a, like I say, it's a really condensed way of the different sections that would organically go into your business plan anyway, but you can basically fill them out and it's quite a fun way, you know, see people put post-it notes up, like different colorful ones and different sections of the boxes, um, you know, and in terms of getting people on the same page, literally, especially if you have team members, <laughs> this can be a really useful tool because you're all working off the one document. It's visual. Some people draw on this. Some people do different things to make it quite creative as well. Um, so that is the business model canvas in a one hour. I would always recommend checking out Strategizer. Um, they are on YouTube as well. If you want to check out their business model uh, videos, uh, business model canvas videos, um, that can also be quite helpful. Um, so we're going to start off, like I say, the first step is going to be the desirability step because we always start with the customer in mind. We're very customer focused. We're very customer centric. Similar to Jeff Bezos with Amazon, he was customer centric. If you look up old uh, YouTube videos of Bezos back in the day, he's, he was actually obsessed with his customers. You know, this is before he started Amazon. He was He was really obsessed with his customers. He really wanted to, he didn't see any reason why. 100% customer satisfaction is not possible. In fact, he thought that could be maybe the bare minimum, you know, and he almost had this kind of glint in his eye that he looked really obsessed by his customers. So it's it's really customer centric and really customer focused what we do in terms of our approach to to having a business or starting a business or growing a business at EIG. Um, so we'll start off with the customer segments and the customer relationships and then lean into channels as well for the desirability. Um, so just to highlight again, this will be the start we're, we're kicking off with, um, and you'll find often they lead into each other. So the desirability often leads into your value prop. You probably see elements of this with your, remember we were getting you to do the value proposition canvas. 
you'll see elements of that coming in. It, it was a very kind of almost um, uh, familiar setup, if you will, um, with the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Okay, so problem opportunity statement. Um, I think before I get into this section, though, um, does anybody have any questions? Please feel free to include it in the chat. Um, and, you know, we'll pick up on that as we as we go along, trying to keep to time. So this is a very brief um brief next exercise um so we will put you in your breakout or we'll give you some time for this as well um so if you just take some time to think about what problem opportunity statement might be so um let's say i think uh for example i'm a customer who is um and you'll have to do this for your own businesses as well um it's basically a statement someone is making to help identify the problems they're experiencing and also the potential opportunities that they could be for you to solve, help solve that problem for them. Okay. So for example, I could say, um, a problem for me is I like, um, hot i like to be warm in my house for example i don't like the cold um as, as so as a person in the northeast of scotland i sometimes find i can get a bit cold a bit chilly i have a deep desire um to to be warm because that helps me feel happier but i find the weather especially lately quite challenging that could be an example of a problem statement that you can listen to and if you're an active listener you could start to identify okay this person this is maybe their location i said i'm in the northeast of scotland that's a demographic hint there for example a need of this person is they wish to be warmer uh, deep desire why is a deep desire so that they could be happy it just makes them you know happy in general maybe so maybe my background where i grew up and things like that it just makes me happy more familiar with it but it's a barrier because the weather is so bad or has been bad recently with storms and things like that and the arctic conditions so have a little think about um and this is another example um a frequent business traveler so so forget about you know Aisha talking about the northeast of Scotland for a second this could now be a problem statement problem opportunity statement of a frequent business traveler so for them they have a need to travel often for business. Okay, so they're always out and about. Maybe they're busy hustling. They're that they're hustler. They, that's what they have to go do. They have a need for low cost on demand transport, so they can avoid queues, delays, and frustration. Okay, but the barriers they don't have the local currency or nowhere to go because they're often traveling. Say they're going to the states. They don't always have you know access to dollars easily. Or it might be somewhere remote, it might be in the Philippines, it might be somewhere else, somewhere that is quite hard to come by local currency. So how can you help this person solve that problem? Right. You might want to create, you know, again, getting to that customer focused, getting into their mindset, you might want to create something whereby if this person travels a lot, um, they can get some sort of reward for their constant travel in terms of it's going to be a reward system. So it can help them get that low cost transport, on-demand transport. Um, and another thing you might be able to offer them is further insight with regards to local currency. You might have different people set up. So when they arrive, things are quite easy for them. There's local people that maybe actually will make their life easier for them because they might meet them in the airport and they have a chunk of local currency good to go, for example. Um, and then that saves them having to go find local currency somewhere and then they don't have to be queuing and things like that. So that's just an example. So have a wee think. Um, the problem, for... the problem, sorry, uh, I think the problem statement is a really powerful um, tool that you can use because I think it, it's from the point of view of the user, the persona who are trying to do something and there's a barrier that's causing them, they have an emotional reaction, this deep desire, there's an emotional reaction there. Um, and I often think about it, kind of the four W's, it's the who, the what, the where, and the why as well. Um, but I think it could be really powerful. It needs to be specific enough so that they can, it can be, kind of be shared and we can understand it, but probably broad enough so that it has some creativity in it. You can draw some insights from it as well. Um, but it's about how you frame the the the, the the problem you know it should it should avoid proposing any solutions just now you're asking why it's simply a question to find those insights and to reflect avoid using jargon as well um, try not to make it unnecessarily complex 
Definitely, absolutely, yeah. Like Chris was saying there, this is about the problem. You're giving the problem the full attention. I, you know, just there with an example of solution is solving the problem, of course, is great, but we're not wanting to hear that just now. So with regards to solving the people's problem, but we're trying to just active listening to actually what the problem of these people are by getting inside their heads. Now, this is a weak task for yourselves to do. So you might have a we think about um your problem opportunity statement as a business owner. Okay, potentially, you might also want to think about, you know, so if you, that's an option for you, you might also want to think about your user in terms of who your customer is, what their problems are. Okay, so that there's different angles you can come at this, but it's always very kind of user focused. It's always very through the eyes of the person who is having the problem. Okay, right. So we'll just have this very quickly, um, a three minute, three minute exercise for that. Um, and I think we can all just stay where we are. Um, no need for breakout rooms for this one. So just three minutes, just for this very quick um, exercise. And then we'll maybe share some examples as well as a group. Thank you. Guys with the Pharrell inclusion as well, interjection. Um, does anybody want to share what they found with their problem opportunity statement? Any good ones they want to share maybe? I can share. Go for it, Georgiana, yeah? Actually, after I pitch on Saturday, I start having all this influx of ideas and how I can improve and just like another world open in my mind. So I wrote it down, how I would like GB Rights Consult to be because it's not... So I want it to be twofold. The first one will be for service users, which will be UK uh, residents. But I also want to include the professionals, the trustworthy professionals. So when I was thinking about this um, problem um, opportunity, I, I wrote it from the both perspective. And the both the, the first one is a UK resident needs to access representation because of the day-to-day -day injustices that happen because there's a lack of tailored prices, transparent fees, and they don't know who can help. And then the okay. second one... Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. And then the second one is UK qualified professionals who, who cannot get clients and cannot because they cannot afford advertisement, but it's also they cannot afford advertisement because they don't get clients. So it's like a bit of a circle. So oh, that yeah. those are my two uh, problem opportunity statements. Great. It bang on you know it's it's fantastic the different angles you've come out from there so you know you've got the user in mind and you've also got the professionals in terms of the people who actually providing the services you're going to be lazing it's almost a b2b um in terms of who you're going to be working with for uh the professional service providers i guess so you would be the 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 link there for the people who actually want to get the clients, but like you say, they can't get the clients because they don't advertise and find a bit tricky. So yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. This, thank you for that. Uh, that was a great um, perspective as well for the for the twofold uh, nature of it. Um, does anybody want to share just one more problem? Yeah, Shiva, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm just talking on behalf of the customer. So I just pitched it saying that. Mm -hmm. I'm a social worker looking after on a company and asylum seekers. I found it um, very difficult to work with them because they don't speak English, they don't want to go to school, they don't want to understand the Scottish culture, they're really resistant to the changes, they are feeling lonely, they are scared, they are confused, and I really feel for them and I want to help, but all the systems, all the tools that I've got, it doesn't help me to help them. So I'm looking for um, a solution to be able to communicate, help them, um, and then bringing them back to the to the real good life. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, in terms of a summary, I suppose of what you're looking for for. Um, you know, yeah. Am I saying it right? Is it yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Um, I suppose that's uh, that's what you're looking for. So, are you doing it more from 
almost is it you said initially user focused but then i think it kind of switched to it's almost to maybe what you were looking for as well yeah so so the targeted the targeted customer is the young asylum seekers mm -hmm. however in order to help them i need to reach out to the social workers or to the teachers or to school to somebody who give me the connection with them because yes. so my um first um customer you know targeted customer is the government short social worker okay. mm -hmm. which leads me to the second customer which is young asylum seekers yeah yeah okay great well great i mean definitely you, you get a sense that there's definitely multiple players here you probably with your problem opportunity statements will have different versions for those different players <laughs> Um, yeah. So, you know, if it's a decision making unit or if it's a user or the government, like you say, the government itself probably has different problems that they're facing. So they probably have a, a problem of maybe hitting certain quotas, for example, or, you know, some some problems that also it's just getting you to think like Chris was saying um, from whoever the user is, whatever mm -hmm. problem they have. And then that helps yeah. you relate better to them and also yeah. help solve their problems better. So you probably yeah. would have different versions of your problem opportunity statement. Yeah. yeah. I, think, yeah. I think you can simplify that. I was really looking forward to your, your Shiva. And, and I think that um, if you look at, is, is the slide still up that says your what problem, what's your problem opportunity statement? Is that slide still up? Yes, it is. Yes. Yes. So, so I think here what you're talking about there is as a young asylum seeker, Mm -hmm. I need, and then yeah. what yeah. it is that they need, so that I can, mm -hmm. you know, live a fulfilling life. You know, I, I can I can become um, embedded in within the community. I can create mm -hmm. friends. I can create, um, but currently, and then what's the barrier that they're currently experiencing? What's the problem that they're having? And I would try and and, and this is uh, every <laughs> try and make it as concise as possible. So that you have the, you know, it's really four lines of a problem statement. Remember, you're doing it from the point of view of your customer, the user. What is the, what is the challenge? What is the problem that they have? Um, and, and walk in the shoes for a moment of your, the user or the customer that you have, the persona of that, of that, of that customer. Keep it really simple. Yeah, right. definitely. Okay. Definitely clear. Because sometimes that's it. You can have the best idea in the world, but because people don't understand or they can't grasp exactly what you're saying because it's maybe not that clear, um, that's where we try and help, you know, um, work with you over the next few months so you can help refine and crystallize that. And like you say, making it concise, making it clear. So your communication is going to be really strong. Um, so that's what we're really looking forward to, to working with you. And we're going to use different tools to help you do that and to get to the heart of the matter of your business. Um, okay. So that was a great, very short, um, exercise there. Just conscious of time again for keeping on, on, on track. Um, so the value proposition statement. Now, remember we discussed this at the boot camp, so you'll be familiar with this, but like I was saying at the start of today's session, it's completely normal. Um, to struggle with this. I was out in MIT this time last year and a big task of what we were doing because we had to pitch was helping to refine that value proposition statement. And, you know, even though I'm quite versed in what I'm doing and I've done it quite a few times, it can still be quite hard to communicate that. It can be still quite hard to get the right words, to find the right raison d'etre, to find the right, there's so many different elements that go into this. And you also, you have to consider your audience, you have to consider many different things. So this is why we're discussing it yet again, and probably won't be the last time we discuss it during this program for sure. Um, so in terms of the value proposition statement, you'll remember this from the bootcamp probably as well. Those of you that were, of course, at the bootcamp, I appreciate you know, everybody here was at the bootcamp. So it's it's great. We're doing this uh, kind of refresher as well. So remember the, the template te typically goes for insert a description of your target audience. Now, again, it's good practice to maybe break into different customer segments. Okay, for that. Who insert a short statement of the need of the user. 
we offer brief summary of your product or service, so your solution essentially, that inserts how it solves the problem or meets the need for the person. So then remember we gave an example of for aspiring entrepreneurs. So this is now the value proposition statement for the RGU Startup Accelerator. For aspiring entrepreneurs in the Northeast of Scotland who need training, funding, and support to launch their business, we offer a comprehensive accelerator program that gives them the knowledge and resources that they need to succeed. So have a little think, and we'd still encourage you to do this, have a little think about your own business. There's another example here. For cinema goers in the Northeast of Scotland who want an affordable opportunity to socialize and be entertained, and there's somebody just entering the uh, breakout room there. We offer a subscription with unlimited cinema trips and discounts that reduces the cost for each trip and makes visiting easy. And then the grand, grand reveal there was it was Cineworld. It was a Cineworld card. Um, so have a little think about that same formula for your own startup. Okay. So for Shiva, just speaking about it there, for young asylum seekers in the northeast of Scotland, who want to connect, to socialize, also probably be entertained. We offer a friendly buddy system um, with like-minded and age-appropriate or similar uh, friends, companions, that reduces the stress of moving to a new country and alienation, for example. That could be, I'm well, just very quickly doing That's very good. I think she's just done it for you, Shiva. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe I'm not as bad as I thought I was at MIT. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. That was it. <laughs> excellent. Yeah. That's all right. It's okay. It's, it could be it could be as straightforward as that, though, you know. So sometimes actually it's when we try and throw everything in that it becomes you lose people. Because, you know, people's attention spans or the goldfish, you know, very short these days. So, you know, how do you communicate to them? clearly as possibly, emotively as possibly, um, in, in the shortest time as possible. And then they want to know more, then you can start that conversation, okay? Um, so uh, like you were saying there, that Cine World, um, this does say 15 minutes, but I'm conscious of the time. It is five minutes to seven. So um, we are going to say uh, work in groups, yes. So Yaya, if you can prep the, the breakout rooms, that'd be great. Um, we have more people joining us, which is great, even in the session. Um, but if you could work on your value proposition statement for the next, I want to say eight minutes. So we're going to half that time. And I appreciate it's not very long, but just in terms of keeping things on track, we will be able to come back to your value proposition statement because you probably will find it evolves anyway. So this is just carrying on on maybe the, the foundations you built in the, in the bootcamp. Remember, like we were saying to you there as well, the value proposition statement is actually really strong for your pitch. You know, and it was great to see some of you use your value proposition for your pitches in the boot camp. Um, so, so think about that. You're trying to communicate it as succinctly as possible in a short space of time. So try and keep it concise. Um, so yeah, Air, are we okay to go with the, the breakout rooms uh, for eight minutes, please? Yep. Um, just a second, I'll set the timer. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So like I say, the exercise we're doing here is just to test and refine your value, value proposition statement. Thank you. Yeah, great thumbs up. So what we want to do here is if you craft your value proposition statement, some of you might have it from last time, which is great. You want to share it with the group, share it with the other people that you're in the in the group with in your breakout room and then be open to feedback. You know, actually just be open to feedback. Um, some of some people might have some good things to say, some good suggestions. Um, and then you can also do the same for them when they share their value proposition. So try and be fair in your feedback um, and try and be productive, of course. Um, but please be open to sharing your value proposition and then getting that feedback from your, your cohort as well. Okay, we're good to go, Yair. Thank you. End up with a value proposition, uh, value proposition statement that solves the problem. So you're describing the customer's problem. And at the end, you need to say how you solve the problem. So there needs to be some connectivity with the final statement back with, with who it is that you're trying to, to, to solve. And usually it boils down to four things that, that most people are trying to do. They're either trying to save money. They're either trying to save time. They're trying to look good or they're trying to solve a problem. Now that's very general, those four things, but usually... Those are the four things will boil down to one of those four things. Um, so, so have a think about that when you're looking at that final line. Make sure that the final line does connect back to 
to what it is that you're doing. And then, of course, I was speaking to Josh and he kind of has two. And some of you will have a multi um, a customer uh, segments, if you like. So one of his segments is the CSR of the corporates. But then also there's the charities that he wants to work with. So it's multi dimensional. And you'd have two value proposition statements, one for each of those. And they'll be quite different because what um, you'd be offering a charity, the problem you'd be solving to a charity is very different from a problem that you'll be solving for a corporate. And so there's no re there's no reason why you couldn't have two or three value propositions um, and it will change over time. But yeah, I think uh, you can really feel that we're a sense of we get we're getting there. I think just with some refinement along the way, I think we'll all have some really strong um, value propositions. Definitely. Thank you. Absolutely. Just to echo what Chris is saying there, um, some of that kind of dials back to your jobs to be done as well, doesn't it, from the boot camp in terms of, you know, the four uh, main categories you're saying there. So that's something also to think about. Shiva, you've got a, your hand raised there, um, I noticed. Yeah. So basically going back to what Chris was saying, so basically the, the, the solution that you are giving out is, you know, you're saving time, you're saving money and you're providing a solution to the problem. What's the fourth one you said? I missed that, Chris. Well, usually, I mean, they might just be one. They might just be one, but there yeah. was, there was so Generally. Solving problem, saving money, saving time, and making someone look good. Yeah, making someone look good, okay. Yeah. Or making an organization look good. Okay, and then are we, are we gonna get the slides as well? Yes, yes. So the slides and the recording, yeah, will be available after this uh, session. And maybe not tonight, but by tomorrow. Yeah, they will be up. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. And I'll be on our ticket that rise through the Teams channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. In your resources tab. Yeah. Okay. Um. Right. Um. And also probably by email as well. So um. Just to to wrap up the value proposition statement, like I say, it's completely normal if it kind of you know something that else was shared in the the group I was in was um it can be actually overwhelming because, um, it's an emotional connection often you have with your business, so that then becomes another challenge to actually get removed um from or enough distance in between the two to actually um communicate um in a in a clear way also so that's also something to be cognizant of um so i'm gonna hand over to chris at this section for introducing the business model canvas um if that's all right chris great thank you yeah um i've requested remote control i think, I yeah. control I think it now, that's can I? come through now yeah let me just check yes there we go so yes, um, business model canvas. Thanks, Aisha. The business model canvas. Um, you're going to get to love this um, over the next uh, few weeks. Um, as uh, Aisha previously said, um, a business model is is just a plan. Let's not over make it over complex. It's a plan of how your business intends to make money, or at least watch this face. But it explains who the customer is, how you're going to deliver value to your customer, and the related details of of kind of financing. Um, and it lets you look at all these different components on a, on a single page. Business models. Let's brief. Do we have sound? Let me yeah. know. Yeah. Okay, great. An organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks. Your customer segments, your value proposition for each segment, the channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the business model canvas, a tool that helps you map, discuss, design, and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. The channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. Customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. The 
revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanisms your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. The key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself, nor will you perform all key activities. Then once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives. So why do we need a business model canvas? It offers several benefits for entrepreneurs. It is a valuable tool. Um, it's, it's a valuable tool because it's visual. It's a structured approach uh, to designing and analyzing and optimizing, but also to communicating your business model, everyone getting on the same page. And um, I'm looking forward to Saturday because you get the opportunity to get your business model canvas, to stick it up on the wall in uh, AO size and start to put post-it notes on it um, and, and, and share it with other people. And they can scrutinize and ask you questions about it. And you start to move stuff. So it becomes a really live document that facilitates discussions among you know mem team members investors customers stakeholders um and it's great for kind of brainstorming and the thing i love about it it's really action orientated because it encourages you as entrepreneurs to identify those activities and initiatives to improve it and to grow the business as well um so as aisha previously said we've it's kind of broken down into these different building blocks and for the first phase, we're focusing on the building blocks around customers. So that's the front of house stuff. It's the value proposition, the customer relationships, the channels, and the customer segments. Um, so here's an example one. Look how simple it is. Um, you know, it's just got three or four kind of post-it notes on each of these. Um, who would this be? This is a little bit of a quiz. Look at this one. Who would this be? Think about their value proposition. Share pictures with friends. Be entertained with friends celebrities, their customer segments, a smartphone users taking pictures and advertisers. Who would that be the business model canvas of? Instagram. Instagram. Oh. It is Instagram, yeah. I believe. Yep. Instagram. Uh do we have another one? I I think you've got control again. Um no. Okay. So yeah, so we're gonna go into um a little bit of a um, more detail into each of these. And the first one is customer segments. So uh, your customer segments are the group of people or the companies that you're trying to sell products to. And you can segment that market um, because groups of customers have uh, similarities. So that could be geography, the Northeast of Scotland. It could be gender, male, female. It could be age, you know, 18 to 24. You could segment, it could be through interests, um, and what that allows you to do, it gives you the opportunity to better serve their needs and customize your solutions that you're providing them with. Um, so you kind of need to know um, to analyze your customer segments uh, and decide which ones you're going to serve and which ones you're going to ignore, particularly at the start when you're thinking about a beachhead market. And you can create customer personas for each of these customers. And that's something that we're going to be doing as we go through this, this, um, this journey. So as you segment the market, Oh, can you go back to that last one? Um, there's different ways that you could do that. And you can target the mass market where you focused on, you know, huge market where you don't really segment the groups. You might be a very niche market where you're centered on very specific groups that have specific needs or specific traits. For an example, would be buyers of high-end handbags. You know, that would be a niche market. You might segment the market. And so that where you would, Base it on slightly different needs according to your, your main customer segment. So, you know, what different value propositions might you have to different segments of the market? An example would be, you know, Volkswagen. They have lots of different ranges of cars for different uh, segments of the market. They have the Fox for the kind of low end. And they, you know, they own, um, those of you that, that know VW will know they own Audi for the high end. Uh, I think they own Porsche as well now. Um, so they have different segments. You just have to go into a supermarket and see the different ranges 
of food that they have, and some of them are appealing to you know the the, the cost saving, the cost conscious consumer, and then they have their premium ranges as well. And that's because they're segmenting their market by income and offering different products and services to those different markets. There might be a diversified market. Diversified market is an organization that caters for two unrelated customer segments with very different needs and very different problems. Amazon is an example of that. Uh, in 2006, they decided to diversify from its retail and e-commerce business into cloud computing services. So they had two very different markets. And then you might have multi-sided markets, and that's where you have two different people that you're appealing to. So it might be corporates and charities. Um, credit card companies cater to credit card holders, also to the merchants who accept those credit cards. Um, so that's a little bit about customer segments, but we're doing a bit more of a deep dive into that on Saturday. Customer relationships are really important. Uh, next slide, uh, Aisha, I think. So what type of relationship do you want with your customer? Are you going to have a very a dedicated assistance with them, offering that one-to-one -one service, having a deep relationship with them? A bit like Apple do with their Genius Bar. You know, they've invested a lot in their Genius Bar so that you can have that very personal relationship, almost concierge type relationship. Will it be a customer service type relationship or even a self-service type relationship? We're seeing more and more of self-service. Just have to go into Asda or McDonald's to see the self-service that we have. But also there are, there are communities of relationships where it's not so much you, but you're pulling a community together to support one another. And again, if you just reflect a little bit on Apple, how they use that community as their customer support with their, um, uh, their, their forums. And they say, you know, you can often go on a forum and you can find uh, the solution to a problem. Uh, so what kind of relationship do you want? Because that will have an impact on your cost uh, and, and your potentially your revenue and your pricing as well. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Channels. People get hung up on channels, but let's try and just simplify it down because there are really only two types of channel. And channel is about the touch points that let your customer connect with your company. It's how you're getting your persona, your company connected to the customer and how you're delivering that uh, that product or that service to your company. Is it through a sales force? Is it the website? Is it through distributors or, or retail units? And usually there's two types of channels. One is which is the channel that you own, where it's a direct distribution. So you own all the distribution channels. Um and you know, it might be you own the retail. So as Aisha said, she owned the retail stores that she had, uh, the shop, the, the the cafes that I had, that I owned those. Um, and and so you know, the customer walked in to the shop, they made the purchase that was made in house using a very direct channel. Um, and then you know, with that, you have internet sales, direct selling, telephone sales, uh, traditional electronic mail as a way of connecting with your customer. And you just need to think about Dell, you know, the, the renowned computer manufacturer. They have a direct distribution strategy by selling its products directly to consumers through its website. Or Tesla, again, employs direct distribution model by selling cars directly through company-owned stores and websites. And they so they maintain complete control over that whole customer experience. And that's something that you might want to think about because they it aligns with Tesla's brand vision for that. And then, of course, the other, um, the second uh, distribution channel is an indirect, and that's where you engage with partners. So this is where you sell into re retailers who have established infrastructures or online platforms, or you have agents or brokers or representatives who use their personal collections with customers who have extensive networks, or you use distributors. Um, but you, you don't have that direct relationship with the customer, which you may want. Um, so Procter & Gamble is an example of a, an indirect um, distribution channel. Um, you, you'll all know Procter & Gamble. Um, they offer a diverse range of products, shampoos, detergents, um, but they sell all that through retail channels like supermarkets or pharmacies. And Ni Nike is another one as well. Um, they, they, they sell through a diverse range of outlets and sports goods, although they do have their own Nike shops now as well. Um, but it's really important when you're thinking about distribution channels because it defines how you connect with your customer. It also defines how you deliver your value proposition because they play a significant role in whether or not you can deliver your value proposition effectively and ensuring that your customer 
understand those advantages and benefits of choosing your offering. And of course, if you have a direct relationship with the customer, then you can go beyond the initial purchase phase. You can offer that post-purchase support and, and you can bring that brand loyalty that would be so important in that after-sales service that you might have. Um, so it's really important to, to think about channels uh, when you're looking at your business model canvas. Uh, next slide, I think. So yeah, so that's that's kind of taken us back to the, the business model canvas. I won't cover this uh, too much, but this is the other side because I call that other, the, the customer stuff um, is kind of front of house stuff. And then everything else that comes is, uh, other than the financials, which is underpinning, is the other stuff. So when we talk about feasibility, so we're going to focus on desirability just now, but when we come to talk about feasibility, we're then going to talk about the back of house stuff. So this is what you're doing to provide that value. So what are the key activities that you're doing, you and your staff are doing? What are you doing every day in your business? Are you making the products? Are you selling and marketing? Are you maintaining the platform? What is it, the activities that you're doing? Because they'll have cost implications. Next slide. So this is all about feasibility. What are the key resources that you need to deli deliver your value proposition? What human resources, intellectual resources, what physical resources and what financial resources are you going to need to ensure that it is, is feasible to deliver your product or service to provide that value to your customer? Next slide. And then what, who, what partners do you need to deliver your value? So who are your suppliers? What operational support? might you need what equipment suppliers might be needing can they deliver what you need on time and in the right quantity and what services do you need what gaps do you have do you need marketing do you need uh, um, support do you need other value uh, to help you to deliver what it is that you need to deliver so that's that's we're going to focus on that in uh, in the second phase in terms of feasibility and then finally, underpinning that is called viability, and that's commercial viability. That's the key costs and the revenue stream. So what is your cost structure? What are your fixed costs, the expenses that remain constant regardless of your sales volume? What are your variable costs, the costs that are going to fluctuate with the amount of sales that you make? What taxes may you, may you need to pay? Uh, and what kind of accounting costs might you need? So that's the costs. And, and of course, how you resource your business and the um, the way in which you deliver your uh, service to your customers will uh, define what your cost base is. And then the other part of that is, of course, the revenue. Is where's your revenue coming from? Is it coming from direct sales? Is it coming from usage fees? Do you have a subscription model? Are they commission based? Um, and you know, are you do you have advertising as part of your offering? So what's the different revenue streams that are coming in? And hopefully your revenue will exceed your costs. Um, so that's underpinning, and that's the viability part of the business. And we'll be covering that in phase three um, of the accelerator program. So that's probably around late March time, but it all comes together to map in this kind of cohesive business model canvas, uh, and it will change. Um, and a lot of it at the beginning is, is, is guesswork. And so we need to go out and validate a lot of what we're saying by talking to our customers. Um, and more and more importantly, we need to measure the impact of the activities that we have. So we need to think about more and more import importantly is, is the environmental impact that we have. Um, what, are the, what are the kind of social uh, and, and uh, cultural impacts that the business has? And how can we measure that as well? And how are we capturing that um, as part of our business? So we are going to cover, although it's not in the business model canvas, we, have, we are cognizant of the fact that it is becoming really important now in business that you have a positive impact on the world in everything that you do uh, and so it's important that we cover that as part of this accelerator program so here's another example oh we've done that example i think that was instagram here's another example oh plus that oh someone said it so this is another one actually this, that's all right this is tesco's so again you know huge multi a billion pound uh, market cap. And this is, is Tesco's one. But I mean, just look how simple that is at the moment. So it's a mass market. That's their one customer segment. Um, they want to access a wide range of projects, ability to collect cup card points and shopping at home. Revenues is through product sales. Um, but, you know, those products are insurance. They have a Tesco's bank. Um, they have a number of key costs, key resources uh, and key partners as well. 
So that's something that we're going to do as part of your own business model canvas. Next slide. And this is what it looks like. So you're going to get one of these on Saturday. Um, and yes, it's going to be your best friend. And you can see how desirability, feasibility and viability map onto those three parts. Because, you know, coming back to Aisha's innovation sweet spot, if we can get it right in those three parts, then uh, we've got a good chance of being successful. Um, finally, I just want to talk about, and this is something that I, I, I like to cover, is that it's really important that you're all open to adapting your business model. Um, because when we come into the Accelerator program, we often have a really clear idea of what it is that we want to do. But many of the businesses that we've worked with over the Accelerator program have pivoted. And that means that their business model has changed from what they came in with. And that's okay, because the most important thing is that there's a market there. There's a customer that has a problem um, that you're going to solve. And I bring this to life by talking about two examples. The first one is YouTube. Um, and these two companies didn't, didn't end up where they started. Um, YouTube uh, launched in 2005 by Steve Chen. Um, does anybody know what YouTube was when it launched? What its original value proposition was? No, it was a dating website. It was a dating website. And they asked people to upload vlogs, basically. So somebody would make a small video and they would upload a vlog, a vlog basically selling themselves and saying, I'm available for, for dates. And, you know, this is what I like to do. I like to go for walks on the beach and I like pina coladas and everything like that. Um, and, the, and their strap line was tune in and hook up. That was their original strap line. Would you believe it? Um, and it launched on Valentine's Day in 2005. And after five days after launching, it had no uploads. It even went on Craigslist and advertised $20, inviting people to upload. And they were going to pay them $20 to upload a video. And still no one uploaded a video. And so they decided to pivot pretty quickly. And they said, right, anyone can upload a video. It's not a dating site. Just anybody can upload a video. And actually, the um, one of the founders uploaded a video. Does anybody know what the first video I ever uploaded on YouTube was? It's not at the zoo or something. It is, yeah, that's right. Who said that? Who said that? Oh. Yeah, it was a day at the zoo. It was a day at the zoo, and it was uploaded by one of the founders. Uh, and by 20, 2006, or so a year later, they had 20,000 uploaded videos and 25 million views a year later. So they realized very quickly that actually the market didn't exist for what it was that they were trying to do. So they pivoted, and now they have a market cap of $30 billion today. Huge, and one of the largest companies in the world. The other one is Pixar. So Pixar started out um, in, um, I think it was 1986, around about that time, early 80s, and it was called the Pixar Image Computing Company. And um, Pixar were um, making software. They were software developers. And they had this software package called Renderman Software. Um, and it was part of the Lucasfilm um, graphics department. And Renderman was basically making animated films. And they were trying to sell this into the film industry, basically. Um, and they weren't getting anywhere fast. Uh, and so they decided to make their own small, short film, short movie. And it was called Luxo Junior. And Luxo Junior was a very short animated film that they were going to show people to say, look, this is what our software can do. And it was a, a story, a short promo film about a lamp, a small lamp. And you can go and watch it. If you, if you, if you, um, you Google it, you'll see it on YouTube. Uh, and it won an Oscar. It was the first ever Pixar movie. It was a short animation about a lamp. And that lamp became famous because that lamp is now in every Pixar film. It's the lamp that jumps in uh, and squashes the eye and then turns to, to face the camera. That's Luxo. Um, and that was released in 1986. Um, and again, they, they, they struggled to sell it going around. And so actually they said, well, why don't we just become our own animation company? Um, and, uh, and, you know, Steve Jobs invested some money um, and they built Pixar and started making their own movies. Um, and became incredibly successful, sold to Disney in 2006 for $7.4 billion. Um, so again, you know, they started off as software developers and they became an incredible, um, they were selling software 
a software company selling into into companies and eventually became uh, an animation studio of their own and created some of the best uh, most well-known films that we know so there's two stories about uh, you know adapting your business model to meet the needs of the market and being agile and being able to pivot and so um don't hold on to your business um if there isn't a market there pivot quickly um, pivot having understood your market, understood your understand your custom customers, because it's your customers in the market that will ultimately decide whether or not your business will fail. It won't be you and it won't be me or, or the EID team. It will ultimately live or die with the market. And what we need to do is position you in the best way possible to make to be a success in that marketplace. And if that means pivoting, then that's what you'll need to do. So that's two stories that I had for you that I wanted to share with you. Um, I'll pass over to Aisha just to do a recap. And I think we're, we're finished because we're running slightly over time, I think, but we're almost there. Yes, we are indeed. Thank you so much, Chris. I think we are running slightly over time, but I think everybody will agree with me. It was worth it. <laughs> so great. Thank you so much for sharing that that insight there. It was great hearing the, the insight with the Business Model Canvas and also the YouTube and Pixar uh, stories, which are really um, impactful. Um, OK, well, thanks so much, folks. You know, we have run a bit over time, so apologies for that. Um, but hopefully you've taken some something by staying till the very end. Um, sometimes that's where the, the jewels are as well. Um, again, just to stress, you know, this is probably one of the most important uh, sessions we will have at the, um, as part of the program. <clears throat> as I say, you know, a business model can make or break a business. So try and make sure you get it right. It can really make the difference in the world. You might be thinking, well, how do I know even what to do with regards to, to which model to take? That's what we're going to help you with in the program. We're going to help you understand where your customers are, what are they into? How do people behave in 2024? What are the emerging trends? We're going to look at all of that, okay, in the program. Thank you so much for joining. Like I say, just what we've done in the session is we've met the team again, um, know what's involved and what you need to do um, with regards to the program and who you're first mentor is you'll made a note if anybody has any questions i will follow up with them there were some that came through i will follow up with you separately <clears throat> and you've also drafted your viral proposition on an awareness of the business model canvas so thank you so much for joining i should just sorry oh, i know we've run over time but one quick one can we take a photograph it'd be great to get a photograph because i think everyone's here yeah that'd be great yeah yeah absolutely i'm i'm down for that yeah should we stop sharing yeah, yeah. Okay. if everybody puts on their their videos, that'll be great. I always forget. I always, I always end up and I forget completely, and I go back and have my dinner, and I'm like, oh, I wish I'd have taken a photograph. <laughs> Good and idea, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. We're all gonna say cheese. Big uh, cheese. <laughs> oh, great! Thank you so much for keeping your spirits up high. Thank you. Good evening. We really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. We'll see everyone on Wednesday. Same place, same time. Same place, same time. Thank you. On bye Zoom. Bye. Have Thank a lovely nice evening. evening. Cheers. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.